Hi Florian, uh, so on March 30th and 31st you'll be coming to Antwerp for Instrument Days, uh, an event that we're organizing in partnership with you, with Florian Leonard Fine Violins and Boho Strings. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what we can expect on that event, uh, what kind of instruments will you be bringing, uh, what are we looking forward to? I think after the pandemic it's a wonderful time to come out again in that sense, you know, exhibitions, musicians, all that mingling in people interested in instruments, maybe investing even into them, some people just who are playing, some people a combination of that, where, where a sponsor wants to help talents, young talents to, to, to play on great instruments which they really need and to, to show superb examples from all different periods. I am of course known to be passionate about partic uh, particularly for the old Italian makers and so we'll have many of those on display mm -hmm. and to choose from. It doesn't only have to be Stradivarius for sound, it can also be much lesser big names that also sound well and to, to give people through such an exhibition the opportunity to, to learn what these other makers might be. What, what do you look for yourself when selecting instruments to sell through your shop? What are the characteristics that you look for? So instruments? for me, of course, as somebody who has built a name for quality and precision and reliability, of course, before I offer anything, I will check first authenticity, all parts original, what kind of condition it is in so that we can present that fully informed to the client. So for example, a sound post crack in the back of an instrument can be a great opportunity if it's re well restored to a player because you basically still today get the, the instrument for roughly half the price it would cost if you didn't have that. And so um, it's, it's good to, to be able to to present well-selected items that you can inform the client about its condition for, for and also uh, price it accordingly. So you can see, you can buy an Amati for $150,000, you can buy an Amati for $2 million. It's a huge span. So again, there's another th opportunity for people to learn to see why are the same maker uh, uh, price so differently. Um, that's an important thing because I see a lot of confusion that people look online and think Amati, okay, click Amati, oh, I see a price, but it doesn't mean that it applies to the instrument that's in front of them, so there are reasons why the prices are different. You'll be coming to Antwerp for instrument days, is that the first time you're coming to Antwerp? I mean, I've been to Antwerp many times was one of the absolutely gorgeous and original cities, well, well pre preserved as well, and ancient. And uh, of course, for uh, during throughout all the centuries, for different reasons, was wealthy, and uh, had always art and uh, culture to a very high extent. Even though it's not a huge mega metropolis, but mm -hmm. it's a it's a worldwide famous city incredible to, to think about the, the size um, of a city that becomes still so famous worldwide. So I look forward to coming there and presenting this old European cultural good, the violin. Yeah. Besides your activities as a reseller of fine instruments, of top quality instruments, uh, you also, and maybe uh, not everyone knows this, uh, but you also make bench copies, you make instruments yourself. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? So, from the beginning, uh, when I was a young boy, I, I enjoyed old Italian instruments or old instruments, antique instruments. I also enjoyed, parallel to that, sound. Um, I remember when my mother was looking for a violin, we made these blind tests behind the curtain. So, I grew up as a little boy doing these blind tests and listening to sounds and the differences. And you know, it's like a language. Kids just pick up things very easily, particularly if they're interested. And I totally loved my parents' interests for literature and theater and music, particularly classical music. And I, I, had, I, I wasted no energy to, to go against that. I just completely 
uh, embrace this this uh, interest direction, and hence, I from the beginning thought violin making is the best of all the violin related professions. So so, where, where I mean, uh, restoration, uh, authentication, the making, and buying and selling. So so the making was my initial core idea and in order to become a good maker I thought I had to work in a great place like Hills to learn to see the originals that we are all looking up to and so in order to do that I had to restore and of course while I, while I was a restorer at Hills and became head restorer there I totally fell in love with the restoration I said wow every day something different there's not too repairs the same. You every time have to build a new construction and different plaster casts adjust to, to different makers original ideas and try to learn and understand the maker interpret this. You feel the wood the whole day, you tap it, you and I was extra interested so I wanted to uh, study expertise of course so I, I had every lunchtime and evening I took my notes, I in bed, even in the night, I was looking at the photographs that I had taken, and uh, and and uh, compared with my notes, and added more notes, and of course, what also happens, your feeling improves because you feel more and more when you touch a piece of wood. You absolutely know what sounds and what doesn't sound because you learn the result, and you have so many makers of the same maker. You have like ten wood Jerry's, ten Amatis, ten. Guarneries and Strats and so all these greatest instruments around you all the time and it becomes second nature to feel and understand what is the right thing to do and I thought um, then when I eventually opened my own shop to to have people that I then taught to to build these instruments together in a team because I think a team has a big advantage to, over just a single person doing everything a team has control to a level that is uh, that is incredible because pe more than two eyes watch what's going on. So you all know you're creating something that is is uh, also seen and in some ways controlled by colleagues that that, that have all the same goal in mind. And uh, that, of course, being directed, uh, in this case, by myself, the one who has studied for a long time these originals, worked with them for so many years, and has become an authenticator as well, therefore having a particularly deep understanding about these instruments, where they come from, what kind of principles have created them, or with which principles they were created by their creators. Let's say Amati is is a man in the Renaissance, uh, sorry, in the Baroque era, who worked with um, Renaissance principles. So you you can see the way these instruments were constructed. They were constructed from within. They were not like in the 19th century from the outside. Because what happened in the, in the 19th century in art in general, things were regurgitated very often they were rearranged in violin making that mean you would draw an, a line around an original use that pattern and make a new violin but uh, the old Germanese never did that they had a, um, a clear idea how to construct it like Leonardo da Vinci would construct the the ideal man's shape size etc or the church window height versus width you know those principles were so so deep inside people that you can feel the strength of that also appearing in those instruments and again we here do it absolutely like that we we adhere to the principles and construct it from within even though we copy but while we're copying we have an extra difficult task to build it with those principles in mind and yet you want the result accidentally to be like what we're copying, which makes the task extremely difficult. Um, and you have to override this because you 
when, when Stradivari made the violin, for example, they were accidental situations that led to a particular result. Therefore, not two Stradivaris are the same. They all vary a little bit. But you can still feel that, uh, that they are from the same person in the, in the particular year you made something. And so I thought all that experience in studying violins and restoring them, running a workshop with 15 people that all uh, are working on the, with the same clarity in mind that I gave to the workshop, um, to not also make finally violins with that knowledge um, would be foolish. Mm -hmm. it's, it is just um, a no-brainer that I would apply that knowledge to understand ground, understand choice of wood, understand truly how to create a right and wood, a good working arching. Archings look similar to most people, but they are very different. So I feel I can make an arching blind. I don't need to, 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 to copy the arching any more directly. I feel when I create an arching, it is like they did it, because they didn't copy something, they created it. And you can only create it with that confidence if you truly understood it like an inventor. So if you understood what they did, they did always the same. It just sometimes resulted in slightly different shapes um, because, because sometimes they left the wood a little higher, sometimes a little lower. But they had one way to create an arching that actually functions well for vibration. And so through having had to uh, do countless um, reconstructions of archings of old violins that were distorted over the years through restoration, maybe thinned down, or a lot of pressure on the, on the table or a bad repaired crack that was a V-shape and then they fit, fitted it together and put some studs underneath and then the patch and I pushed it out and somewhere else it sunk. So very often we had to, I mean really hundreds of archings I had to remodel. So we, we make usually a pl positive plaster cast and reshape that positive, reducing it in height because, because you don't want to make an arching bigger and bigger and bigger. You want to bring it back where it was because it was all very often pushed outwards and now you want to reduce it back to where it was giving the wood more new uh, breathing space. So through this, through this exercise, correcting and arching became an exercise for me to understand how the real arching would have looked and why, and eventually it became second nature. And so that is nice when I copy a violin. I don't necessarily need to copy every mistake this violin has. So you can, you can, uh, uh, correct a little, optimize it again, because these violins have 300 years of life, but not every Stradivari is always at optimum. You sometimes hear about these tests where modern violin seems to be better than the old. It's not always uh, necessarily the best Stradivari that they used in those tests. So some are not well adjusted and you can optimize them. That's was one of the things we do here mm -hmm. with old ones, but you can also do the same to a new one. So we then, when the product is finished, we, we sometimes we dismantle it and correct something until it really works at optimum. But it's a, it's a beautiful outcome because we have a long waiting list, people from all over the world ordering them, and it's very satisfying to be able to also create something that is really in demand, not through PR or artificial means, or through just dealing, it's really created here and it's living and, and it's in demand. So that's actually very fulfilling. Florian, you uh, recently celebrated your 40th anniversary in the business. Uh, what makes you still so passionate about this profession, about selling the violins, about authenticating, about uh, making these bench copies? Mm -hmm. It's a nice question because it's really a true question that, that applies. 
Um, so indeed, on the 12th of February this year, um, it happened to be my 40th anniversary in having started and embarked in this passion uh, of mine, the, the violin making um, and everything around it. Um, of course, I started earlier than that already, right, like from 15. Um, when I was 15, I, I was in love with the instrument making idea and because I played cello and my mother played violin, I had access to such instruments and we had some things lying around and I wanted to mend them. But of course I wanted to inform myself how one should do it. So I went to violin makers and studied a little bit how that, that, uh, how that should work. And then I got a piece of wood and I carved the back of a viola and, and then gained experience a little bit with this and I just felt I didn't even realize it myself, but my parents saw how passionate I was about this. And at the beginning when they said, oh, why don't you become a violin maker, I, I thought, oh, you're joking, I will study medicine, I will, because I thought I'll become a surgeon. But for the similar reasons, I love to use my hands to make things work. And the human body is also a, in some ways a mechanical thing, to a certain extent, without uh, harming anybody's idea about the soul and the body but uh, but in the end there are cells there's a heart that pumps pumps uh, blood vessels around the body etc it all has to function and the, the, the doctors and the surgeons uh, task is to make that work and the same is with the violin the violin is nearly like an like a, an alive object there are the vibrations of different frequencies in different places different things have different functions and every form has a function and it has to just work. And so that aspect I think fascinated me as a young young teenager and um, then it was became my dream to go to the violin making school in Mittenwald and uh, to my detriment there were 1200 applicants and they took 10 people and I just thought my god this is such a dangerously <laughs> small number that they would take. I have to be one of those. I absolutely thought, what am I going to do if they don't take me? But so, so they invited uh, people after you had, after you sent in a, um, a, a, your CV and the drawings and your marks and uh, artwork. Um, they selected 50 people to come to the school for a three day or two and a half day court, um, test. And yeah, fortunately I I was amongst the chosen ones and so I went to that school and it felt like an enormous privilege to be there but my dream was already ahead of me and I, I dreamt of working for Hill and Sons which was at that time the bible of expertise. They don't exist anymore sadly. In 1991 they closed their doors um, but uh, I still had this uh, lucky time to work for them after the school. And uh, coming back to your question, what, what keeps me going, um, I, I would say I have not lost an inch of, of passion for this. It, if anything, it continuously grows because um, as I'm more experienced, I, doors open more and more and more great instruments come to me and, and uh, great uh, musicians come and want those things and have want your advice and your help and adjustment and they walk away with a big smile in their mouth of course it's a it's a it's something you are grateful every day that you can do this you also paint here around the shop uh, there's many paintings uh, of yours is that an activity that you still do is that a creative outlet that informs uh, your instrument making and selling, or is it uh, something that takes you away from, from that world? I mean, when I was a boy, I, I, because my father was a painter, I had access to canvas, oil, paper, all kinds of pencils and crayons or plaster or different means and the wood, wood carvings um, for prints. So I did all that since I'm a little child and um, in some ways when you look at, uh, at these uh, child prodigy violinists uh, with 10 or 9 years of age they can do so much and most grown-ups don't know how to do this. 
and then they admire this and the kid I had a little bit this privilege of this feeling when I was a young boy that uh, I could do something many people who want to go to art school with 25 and finish had tr difficulty to do so the good thing is I didn't uh, it, it, I didn't it didn't go up into my head and I became arrogant but but I I remember that uh, it's um, a fas fascinating thing that a child can excel in something so well. So I always had pleasure in, in, in drawing, painting, designing, looking at shapes and going to the galleries all over the world. Also with that eye that you, that you gained through doing this so much, um, you look at things differently, which I think in the end has benefited my violin making restoration as well as uh, authentication career because also what happened through this interest in in art and painting that I I spent countless days and hours and weeks in most galleries throughout Europe several times and now living in London for, for nearly uh, 36 years um, I I of course had the pleasure to to have great galleries here and, and, and at my doorstep, if you want. And and uh, what I remember as a as a young boy, that I would go into a room in a gallery, and then I see oh these are the Flemish painters and these are the Dutch painters and and these are the Italian and these are the French, and British, German, and I always notice. It's quite different, but within a room it's quite similar. So I thought, oh, there's of course a school of thought behind that. And so I tried to understand to, and it's, you know, it's something children sometimes have, have uh, their own ideas. And my idea was to ask myself this question, what is it that defines the difference between this room and that room? Um, so, and I tried to to monitor this and maybe ask my parents questions, but I also looked at it. And you slowly learn. You see there may be economical difference there that, that created the painting. There's probably a demand behind it. There's maybe religious reasons, um, the political reasons later on. So, so what has shaped all this? And, um, so there's stylistics and uh, I really enjoyed trying to look at that in detail and the minute I started violin making I was interested from the beginning and I think that was uh, helped me a lot interested to understand why what what defines this why is this Italian why is this old communist why is it 17th century not 18th or why is it German or English or French um, and so so this the, the painting which I don't do much anymore these days because I don't find enough time um, was something that I just really enjoyed but I didn't want to become a painter because I felt coming from this kind of idealistic family in, of artists um, that the art market is, is so commercially driven that I would probably suffer inside this I just felt when I was a young young man that uh, to paint for money I, I thought no I can't do this but I felt violin making the better I am the more people will want my product and that in return means or equals success mm. in art I couldn't see being a great painter equals success and you know I found that an uncomfortable idea that uh, that some PR firm like Saatchi and Saatchi would would make you famous or maybe not discover you and therefore you don't become famous. You know, that's uh, I found it a weird concept. Besides being incredible pieces of art, instruments are also an interesting uh, investment. Uh, they have great economic value. Can you tell us a little bit more uh, about the the commercial or the economic side of things? Economically speaking, um, I think this whole thing about antique violins mm -hmm. is an interesting one because we are steering towards very interesting unknown times. Nobody knows exactly where we're going. 
but exactly in such a time, if you look in the last 150 years, it has always been great to own things like violins, because if you, because the violin is a very transportable good, so depending where the market is, you can take it, and there's always a market. There's never a time ever where the whole work is, world is dead. There are always people who benefit out of situations and there are people who have feel a need to do something good, to contribute as well because they're doing well at that time. And so there's always a market for violins. But the beauty about violins is also it doesn't overheat because the kind of person who invests or buys or owns or collects and lends out or plays is a rational person. He's not suddenly raising and paying double tomorrow. Um, like unlike sometimes in modern art. In modern art you do have that. Everybody thinks, oh this name, oh we have to buy so we buy like stocks and shares and buy everybody puts it in Geneva in some some uh, warehouse and never looks at it so because it's just a currency. Violins are not like that. Violins are loved uh, objects of art and kind of design if you want and they are also a tool for musicians to be used. So people who collect most of the time know what they have and then they lend it to someone to use. It's a beautiful thing.